Support comes from Cal Poly Pomona. Transform your career with a master's degree from their College of Business accounting program and STEM-based programs in digital supply chain management and business analytics. Learn the latest tech and skills to optimize operations and drive business success. Visit cpp.edu slash CBA. I'm Helga Davis, and I'd love for you to join me in conversation on my podcast, Helga. I'm speaking with artists, scholars, and cultural changemakers about the path we're all on. Listen wherever you get podcasts. LAist Studios. Hi, everyone. This is Retake. I'm your host, John Horn. In this week's episode, why New York Times film critic Manola Dargis is optimistic about women in the film world for the first time. I started to realize that it was kind of easy to find movies to review by women. You know, I used to feel like a little uh, truffle hound, like, OK, where, where can I find the interesting movie by a woman? Plus, does female success have to come at the cost of male ego? That's the premise of a movie, Fair Play, which sold to Netflix for $20 million at Sundance. I talked to its director, Chloe DeMont. But first, there was some pretty big news this week about Alec Baldwin and the fatal shooting on the Rust set in 2021. I spoke about it in my weekly entertainment news chat with LAist Morning Edition host Suzanne Watley. So this week, prosecutors in New Mexico, as expected, filed involuntary manslaughter charges against Alec Baldwin for fatally shooting cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the movie set of Rust. That was back in October of 2021. And they also charged the movie's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. She was responsible for weapons on the set. So let's start first with a statement about Baldwin from SAG-AFTRA, which is the performers union of which you and I are both members. Yes, let's start there. About two weeks Weeks before the criminal charges were filed, but after authorities said they were imminent, SAG issued a statement saying that Hutchins' death, and I'm quoting the union now, was, quote, not a failure of duty or a criminal act on the part of any performer, unquote, and, quote, an actor's job is not to be a firearms or weapons expert, unquote. And after reading the filings, I would say that SAG couldn't be more wrong and certainly could and should have waited until Baldwin was charged before it offered an uninformed legal opinion about his killing Hutchins. Okay, how so? Well... Baldwin had two official jobs on Rust. One was an actor, the other was a producer. And I would argue he had another role, which is he's the person who sets the tone for the overall production. Rust might have been an independently financed Western, but more than that, it was an Alec Baldwin film. It was his passion project. And as is spelled out repeatedly in the charging papers, Baldwin didn't set a good example. So prosecutors said that Baldwin, and I'm quoting again, failed to appear for mandatory firearms training, unquote, before filming and then received limited onset training because he was on his mobile phone. So let's just pause for a second here. Helena Hutchins is dead and Baldwin wasn't focused on mandatory safety training because he was chatting on his phone. So if you see your boss is behaving that way and cutting corners, what's the takeaway? And it's more than what Baldwin did on the day of the shooting, like aiming his gun at a real person, which no performer should ever do. Prosecutors said there were, quote, many instances of extremely reckless acts or reckless failures to, to act by Baldwin in a 10-day period before he killed Hutchins. Interesting. Um Looking at the court filings, as you did, what else stood out to you, John? Well, the film's armor, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, also was charged with involuntary manslaughter, and she was arguably wholly unqualified for the job because of her lack of experience. And according to the filings, she failed to keep live ammunition off the set, she didn't inspect the gun, and she wasn't present when it was used. That said, if a producer, Alec Baldwin in this case, hires someone who is underqualified, you could mitigate that decision with additional safety steps, right? That makes sense, but the production did the exact opposite. There wasn't even a safety meeting on the day that Baldwin killed Hutchins. 
Now, what about the assistant director who handed Baldwin the gun and declared it to be a cold weapon, which would mean that it was not loaded with live rounds? Well, he has also said that it wasn't he who handed Baldwin the gun. It was Gutierrez Reed. There is some dispute about that. But Halls entered into a plea agreement um, with prosecutors. He has already uh, accepted a sentence of six months behind bars and six months probation. Um, I suspect if there is a trial, if there isn't a plea agreement reached, Dave Halls will be a lead prosecution witness uh, for the government. And I should say that Baldwin has said in the past that he didn't pull the trigger. The filing papers said there are repeated images of Baldwin's finger on the trigger of the gun at the day in question. And Hannah Gutierrez Reed, in a statement from her attorneys, uh, defended her ex actions and said she actually asked for extra training and more time to focus on her duties, uh, but was rebuffed by the production. Now, Alec Baldwin and Hannah Gutierrez Reed, if they are convicted, could they end up in jail or even prison? Mandatory minimum five-year sentence uh, if they're convicted because there is a firearm enhancement on the involuntary manslaughter charges. The involuntary manslaughter charges themselves carry a maximum statutory penalty of 18 months. So there's a range. Uh, obviously, there hasn't been a trial. There hasn't been you know an official indictment um, where either Baldwin and Gutierrez Reed would appear in person or virtually. So there are many things that would have to happen before there's a trial. All right. Thank you so much, John, for following this story, the implications of which go much broader than what happened that day on that movie set in New Mexico. My pleasure. Thank you, Suzanne. Coming up, it's true that no female directors were nominated in this year's Oscars, and women rarely get a chance to make a big-budget blockbuster. But it's no longer very hard to find the work of female filmmakers, and that makes New York Times film critic Manola Dargis happy. Support comes from Cal Poly Pomona. Launch your career in Masters of Business Analytics, one of the fastest-growing fields worldwide. Cal Poly Pomona's MSBA, with its STEM designation, is designed with industry context, data, and artificial intelligence technology that shapes the current and future needs of the business industries. Students in the MSBA program learn from faculty experts and project-based activities that will enhance their business analytics skills and knowledge. Learn more at cpp.edu slash cba. Frank Molina pioneered rocket science at Caltech and for the U.S. military, but horrified that the U.S. might weaponize his work, he walked away. I left in 1946 because I had an offer of a job at UNESCO in Paris, and I left on a two-year leave of absence. Little did he know, the FBI was on his tail. Listen to L.A. Made, Blood, Sweat, and Rockets, wherever you get your podcasts. Women make up slightly more than half the U.S. population, except in Hollywood. Despite years of promises to make the movie industry less the dominion of men, and white men at that, female filmmakers still are hired for only a fraction of all directing jobs and hardly any movies at all that have a big budget. Still, there are some hopeful signs. That's the focus of a recent New York Times column by film critic Manola Dargis. I invited Manola to talk more about the issue. You strike me in this topic as a glass half full kind of person. I am certainly a glass half empty if there is a glass at all. So let's talk at all. Let's talk first about your optimism and why you feel that things are starting to change or have changed in terms of female filmmakers and stories led by women. I would say, John, that in usually I am very, very much a glass is maybe one tenth full person. You know, I, the sky is always falling. It's, it's on my head. It's crushing us all down and it's horrible. However, last year, I just realized that I was seeing a lot of movies by women and I was seeing a lot of movies by women at, I remember I, I wrote about uh, a lot of women at Sundance in 2022 uh, and then every festival I went to, but then also I, I started to realize though this was, you know, kind of looking back over the years that I had 
that it was kind of easy to find movies to review by women, that it was no longer this kind of, tr you know, I used to feel like a little uh, truffle hound, like, okay, where, where can I find the interesting movie by a woman? And that that wasn't the case. And it felt very kind of ordinary. And um, especially as I was going, you know, reviewing the year for to do my top 10, which is usually kind of like towards, I guess, November, you start thinking about it. I was just really struck. And then I just started thinking about how this had happened kind of gradually. And and it was just coincidental that we had these two large annual um, surveys that came out, um, one called the Celluloid Ceiling and the other one from USC Annenberg, which has a much longer title that I don't always remember. Um, and both of those had different data sets. Um, Celluloid Ceiling looks at the top 250 domestic box office movies, and Annenberg looks at the top 100. And there's pretty big difference there because the top 100, as we know, is where most of the larger and certainly the American studio, you know, movies are going to be parked. And those movies are absolutely, you know, invariably almost always directed by men. And you look at, the, you know, the studio numbers for the most part, again, with some exceptions like Universal and yay Universal, um, that most of the directors that are getting the gigs and certainly the higher profile gigs with the wider releases are men. However, if you actually start to look overall, there's just, for me, there's, it is empirical that things are better and it's not just a little better. It's much better. Is it great? Absolutely not, but it is better. And I felt particular, maybe because of the pandemic, maybe because of everything else that's happening in the world, it was really nice to seize on some good news and then to share it. The USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, that's the name of the right. of the group. Their study, as you said, looks at the top 100 grossing movies. And I think you and I both know that I think all 20 of the highest grossing movies last year were directed by men. Certainly the top 10 mm -hmm. were. Um, and they found that just 9% of those 100 top grossing movies released last year were made by women, which was 30% down from the previous year, you're saying, look at the long tail, ignore the big blockbusters, set aside the Jurassic World, the Top Guns, the you name it, sequels, uh, spinoffs, remakes, retreads, whatever. There is where you find more women directing, and that's what gives you hope. Yeah, I think it's it's about looking at the larger picture. Again, I totally understand why Annenberg is looking at the top 100. And their argument, I believe, is that, you know, those are the movies that most people see. And that may be true, certainly theatrically. Um, but as we know, most people actually are watching movies, you know, at home. And so, and that information is not always widely available, but we do have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies. And if you start going down and you do not have to go past the first 200, you start seeing a lot of women. Um, I mean, this is something that you and I, I think both noticed a while ago because we noticed how many women were directing uh, documentaries, for example. That has always been a really good way for women to kind of break in because, to make a documentary, you know, you kind of need will, uh, a little bit of money, a camera and a recorder, and you can just go out and do it yourself. You do not need to ask permission. You do not need to negotiate with a producer. You don't have to give notes to a studio executive. You can go out and if you make something good, someone is going to see it and maybe put it in a festival and it will have a life. I'm going to play a clip from a movie that is about two of your colleagues, Megan Tui and Jody Cantor. This is a scene from She Said, which is the name of the movie and the name of the book they wrote about their Harvey Weinstein reporting. Uh, it's a scene that's not in the book that actually was invented by Re Rebecca Lenkowitz, the screenwriter, and Maria Schrader, the director of She Said. It unfolds in a bar, and you're going to hear Carrie Mulligan, who plays Megan Tui, fending off a man. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, did you did you see my friend over there? He he said hi. Could you leave us? We're talking. I absolutely will. I totally understand. But I was just thinking maybe I could just All have right, a man, moment. We're having a conversation, so if you could you just. You should be doing something else. So. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. I would bend you over. Fuck you. Fuck you. Get the fuck out of here. Fuck you, man. Get the fuck out. It is a great <laughs> it is a great scene and it's not in the book. It was invented. And I think it really says 
in many ways, it says what's going on in Hollywood. These are women who are doing their job and some guy is going to tell them what they should be doing instead. And as Kerry Mulligan's character says, no. And yes. I think and, I think yeah. you can read that scene as almost a metaphor for a lot of what's going on or has gone on in the industry. I think in the industry and also the the larger world, you know, I think that we are, you know, it's really interesting being an old person now and 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 thinking about things that I used to take for granted. I used to take for granted that sexual harassment uh, and you know, even abuse was just part of what it meant to be a, a woman in the world, you know. And if women were being exploited regularly, or in terms of the so-called casting couch, it was just like that's the way it is. It's a terrible industry, and you just you just have to kind of you know deal with it and move on. That's it was just kind of a given. It was the air we breathe, you know, in a kind of really strange way. And that's a really bizarre thing to say as someone who's been a committed. Uh, feminist for so long, but it is really, it was the air that we breathed. And then it started to change. And so I think that the optimism that I feel about the industry, yes, it is in part about what is happening in the industry, which is, you know, a kind of horrible, ossified, creepy thing that just doesn't change fast enough. At the same time, you know, the industry has changed, the world has changed. And I think it's extremely important for us to remind ourselves of that fact, not to, you know, kind of prematurely say, hurrah, it's been won, or pat ourselves on the back, but to say, you know what, change is possible. It, you know, it it is going to take a, a while for things to get to a place where we won't have to meet anymore and talk about this very issue, but we are on the way. And I say, you know, let us at least acknowledge that. Do you think were it not for the opening credits or your own knowledge, you could watch a movie like she said, or women talking or till or the woman King and know that it was directed by a woman and not by a man. Is there a certain way that women tell stories that is different? And I don't know how we would define that difference, but do you think it exists? And can you, can you spot it in a way? I can't. Honestly, I really can't. I mean, you know, I, I really think it depends. I certainly believe that there are plenty of men who are really great feminists. You know, I, I work with one, A.O. Scott at The New York Times. So um, but I do think that there are things that I watch, like, let's say she said, which is a movie I'm not I wasn't I, I couldn't write about it in The New York Times because it's a New York Times production kind of, you know, it's it's so connected with The New York Times. But I, I can talk about it on a podcast. And one of the things like, for instance, I really liked about the movie is it really emphasizes the fact that these are working journalists. Yep. These are women who are really gutsy, who are going to walk up to a house and knock on a door, not knowing what's on the other side of it. And I thought that that was thrilling, you know, and is it because, you know, the book was, you know, by two women and the screenplay and was directed by one? I don't know, but I do think there is a, a quality of the lived experiences of women that you will get more with um, women filmmakers. And, you know, part of my exasperation with how things were certainly a, through a lot of the 2000s uh, or, you know, several decades ago is just like it was very boring just watching dudes all the time. You know, I mean, I like variety in my movies. I like variety of genre. I like different filmmakers. I like different actors. I also like different protagonists. And just watching one dude after another conquer the world is very dull. At the very least, let's change it up. So for me, it's not just about, you know, um, my sense of equality and my feminism. It's all about it's also about making the movies themselves more interesting. The other thing I would add about She Said is that Dean Bacay, who hired me at the L.A. Times and was the editor of The New York Times, is, I think, the definition of an ally in this film. He lets the reporters do their job. He's not going to mansplain anything. He's going to let them do their work and he's going to get out of the way. And I think something else happens in a movie that is near and dear to me, and that is the movie Women Talking. I'm going to play a little bit from a mm. trailer for this film. Hope for the unknown is good. It is better than hatred of the familiar. That's Rooney Mara in Women Talking. This is Sarah Pauly's adaptation of the Miriam Tay's novel. It was my favorite movie of the year. And something 
interesting happens in this story. There's a character named August played by Ben Wishaw. These are a group of women who have been been denied education. They don't know how to read or write. Ben Wishaw is essentially their scribe. He comes in and he helps them tell their story. And that, to me, is almost a metaphor for what should be happening in Hollywood. And I wish there were more studio executives like that. But I think in in a way that women talking is a great metaphor for how the world can be when men help women tell their stories and get out of the way. I mean, change is not going to happen unless the other, you know, 49 percent of the population helps make it happen. You know, I mean, women can only do so much. Um, I mean, this is a question about, you know, for instance, the DGA, which is basically very male dominated. And it's like and I understand it's a very, very tough competitive business. But you can and you can understand why people may not necessarily want to help other people because they themselves are going through all sorts of like terrible things in the industry, including ageism. You know, I mean, or they've had maybe one too many, you know, flops or whatever. Why? Why should they? But I think that that means that there has to be a real shift in the culture, you know, in the cult. And I think that, you know, I think the problems in the movie industry are so deep and it includes like, how is work done? Um, you know, what kind of, how can you expect women and particularly women and men who have children to work the punishing hours uh, that is now standard in the movie industry? I interviewed Ryan Murphy uh, a couple of years ago. And one of the things I talked to him about was how he found time for his children. And he was really emphatic about being very hands on with his kids. And I think that's really important. I've spoken to women filmmakers who are, you know, have you know, working, um, you know, helping each other out because they have to, because, you know, you suddenly have a kid who's sick. Maybe you're a single mom and you don't have anyone else to help you. Maybe you actually do have help, but you don't want anyone else taking your child to the doctor. There has to be a way that the movie industry and its old ways of thinking really change to really reflect people's actual lives. Yes. And I know from talking to Sarah Pauly about women talking that Frances McDormand, who is in the movie and a producer, you know, when it was an issue about what the working conditions and schedules going to be like, she said, listen, this is the way we're going to make this movie. This is what Sarah needs and you're going to do it. And, and if you have somebody like Frances McDormand saying this is how we're going to accommodate a working parent, you can get it done. Let's talk about the. Right. Let's talk about a parallel universe, not everything everywhere all at once or a Marvel movie. <laughs> it's the parallel universe that you and I just came back from, and that is the Sundance Film Festival, mm -hmm. which has long been committed to diversity and I would say in the last couple of years has really achieved it. Looking at this year's slate of films, documentary competition films, 11 of the 12 movies were made by women, dramatic competition films, 8 of the 12 movies were made by women. It goes on and on. There were 94 female filmmakers at the festival, 60 feature filmmakers, uh, 60 features were directed by women. I don't know if that's an exception to the rule or that's where we're going to get the next generation of filmmakers because Sundance can be a launching point. But I'm wondering when you come back from the festival or even during it, were you aware of how many movies there were made by women and featured women in prominent roles? Well, I mean, it was a little hard not to see it because, um, I mean, pe most people don't know this, but before you watch the movies at Sundance, there is a series of little kind of uh, festival promos that run and you get to watch them about, you know, if you see like 35 movies like I did or, <laughs> you know, you get to watch the same promos 35 times. So there was one that was dedicated to women filmmakers. So, you know, Sundance is very aware of um, what it's doing. And it was uh, this year kind of almost crowing about it, you know, all power to it. I, Sundance has for a while been, I've, I thought, especially the dramatic uh, U.S. competition has been pretty split evenly between men and women filmmakers. Um, and I asked, I interviewed um, the old, the old program, uh, head of programming, John Cooper, um, you know, maybe about seven years ago. And I asked him if they did it deliberately and he said no. And I burst out laughing because I don't believe it for a single second. I think they're very mindful and I think it's important that they do. You know, I think no one wants to use the, the word quota, but I'm actually completely OK with that. Whether or not these women 
will go on to other jobs and certainly like the bigger, you know, uh, studio jobs is another question. There are a lot of women who've, who've gone through Sundance and who have disappeared. But again, this was in the past and I'm not so certain about the future. I think there's a certain amount of awareness that, you know, even at the big studio, you know, the remaining big studios, there's not that many, but that they have to hire women. And it's very interesting to see who gets hired and when. I mean, you know, it is absolutely thrilling to see someone like Gina Prince Bythewood directing um, a fairly, you know, big budgeted um, action adventure movie, which is something that she's wanted to do for a very long time. She did The Woman King. It was a hit. It was generally well received. And, you know, I my hope is that something like that will be commonplace Whereas right now, you know, there are there's only one Wonder Woman, you know what I mean? Um, and then there's, you know, the Avengers and that one lady in a tight unitard. <laughs> so It's worth noting, too, that Gina Prince-Bythewood got her start at Sundance with her film Love and Basketball. Let me ask you this last thing. Um, I, I think you and I both have mixed feelings about the Academy Awards. I don't think we have <laughs> mixed. I don't think we have mixed feelings about the directing nominees all of which were men this year. This follows wins by Jane Campion for directing Power of the Dog and Chloe Jaw for making Nomadland. So it's the Academy Awards. It's not you know, like the world speaking, but when you see that only men are in that category, you're optimistic. You think there's a sea change. How do you explain that? And does it bother you? Um, well, you know, but John, the Academy sucks unless it doesn't, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> That's true of so, everything in life, Manola. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to just say, OK, let's see. And as I said, you know, I think progress does not happen. Uh, you know, there's a lot of starts and stops with any sort of, um, you know, liberation movement. <laughs> um, and there is going to be we're going to kind of lurch forward and then we might take a few baby steps back. And so this year, you know, I don't even know if I think this was a fantastic year across the board, you know, and you, if you look at all the nominations, you can kind of understand whatever rationale was going on. But the fact is that there are women directors. They have been recognized even by uh, an organization like the Academy, maybe not in the, you know, slotted five, uh, you know, uh, places for a director, but women are here. They're not going anywhere and everyone just needs to get used to it and watch some movies by them. You talk about how the audience is receiving these movies. This is where I am I am really concerned because if you look closely at the box office, which again is, you know, a outward invisible sign of how movies are doing, mm-hmm. you look at outside of The Woman King, uh, she said did not do any business. Uh, women Talking didn't do any business. Um, it was very hard for these films to get any people to show up tills the same thing. So she said $5.8 million domestically women talking $2.6 million domestically till $10 million domestically. I mean, that's what top gun makes in an afternoon combined. So the audience isn't showing up for these movies in theaters. Well, but we're talking about different audiences, aren't we? I mean, the movies that you're taught that you're talking about that were directed by women, those are all so-called, you know, if they're not so-called specialty items, they are definitely uh, um, not top gun. They're not made for the top gun audience, the top gun audience. You know that how many theaters did that open in? I mean, that was not over 4,000. Yes. And you know? yeah, I mean, certainly it was much wider. Yes. Tar opened in what a handful of theaters. Yep. We're talking about two different things. This is like you know a wheelbarrow and a, I don't know an iPhone. I mean they're just two. I can't even put them in the same category. I think that what you have located is that the specialty divisions, the movies that are made for you know so-called adults, the kinds of movies that you know where people actually talk and don't just you know jump in a plane and zoom around um, at some unidentified enemy that those movies are struggling across the board, whether they are directed by men or directed by women for the female audience or for, you know, uh, for quadrant audience or whatever. Those movies are having a very tough time and that is very worrisome. But I believe that that is a different discussion, though I understand, though, you know, women might there might be more women working in that area. I'm not really particularly sure that that's even the case. you know, the, the the great worry that I have is that we're going to be left, you know, at some point with nothing but big blockbusters 
and then a lot of really small entities and we'll go to these theaters and it'll be like a jazz club, but we won't be able to smoke. Yep. The last thing I'm going to say is I think post pandemic, the world has changed for those kinds of films. One of my you know favorite movies of the last 10 years is Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird. It grossed almost $50 million domestically. I think a movie like that today maybe makes $5 million in theaters. That to me is the area of concern. And yes, there's streaming alternatives, but if those people, if people don't show up for those movies in theaters, I, my worry is they're, they're not going to continue to get made. Agreed. But who's the villain there? The movie industry itself. There you have it. Manola, it's so good to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Let's do it again. That was Manola Dargis, the co-chief film critic of The New York Times. Her recent Critics Notebook column is titled, For the First Time Ever, I'm Optimistic About Women in the Movie World. Coming up, the Sundance movie that sold to Netflix for $20 million looks at what happens when a woman gets a promotion before her boyfriend. Spoiler, he doesn't take it very well. I'm John Horn, host of the Retake podcast from Elia Studios. At the height of the pandemic, with theaters shuttered, the performance group Culture Clash turned the streets of L.A. into a stage to film a new version of their beloved play, Chavez Ravine. This was our community, our home. And that is something you can never erase from your cabeza. Join Culture Clash's Richard Montoya and me for a screening and conversation. It's February 25th at the Crawford Family Forum. Get your tickets at elias.com slash events. Fair Play is the title of a movie that just premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. It was acquired by Netflix for $20 million. It's fitting that so much money was involved in the sale because money, and many, many more millions of dollars, is the backdrop for the film's story. A young couple work at a Wall Street firm. When the woman in the relationship gets a promotion that the man thought he'd receive, he initially congratulates her, but then things change. The film was written and directed by Chloe Dumont. Her feature film debut was partially informed by her experiences as a TV writer, where often the boys' club rules mandate that you can either laugh at crude jokes or not and be cast aside in the writer's room. I sat down with Dumont in the somewhat echoey business center of her Sundance Hotel as the Fair Play sales deal was closing. I want to ask you a little bit about the premise itself. In the setting, because I think Wall Street, you know, you can look at works of fiction like Wolf of Wall Street, and they're not entirely fictional. Was that world important to you in terms of where the story would unfold? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think you, you, you hit it right on is, is the fact that, you know, uh, Wall Street is... It has so much money and so much power. Um, it's still a little bit dated, you know, in, in many ways, especially with, like, gender dynamics. Um, like you know the boss can call her those vile things in the movie and it doesn't matter like that's what it is you're uncomfortable with that quit and we'll find someone else you know it, it's a volatile world and i was interested in studying that world to show how the volatility of that workplace environment feeds into the volatility of a relationship and vice versa and it becomes this you know vicious cycle and the premise of course is that the way luke sees this relationship is that they are equals and they are going to succeed as equals and rise as equals. There is a partnership. And if somebody's ahead of the other, it's probably going to be him, but they're going to do this together as equals. And when that balance is shifted, I don't know if he doesn't have the skills. I don't know if he doesn't have, you know, the training. He can't deal with it. That his idea of what is equal mm -hmm. is very rigid. Mm -hmm. He is a man who adores Emily for her ambition, right? For her intelligence, for her strength. That's why he's attracted to her at the same time, because of the way he was raised, because of what, how he was conditioned probably as a kid, certain values and ideas of traditional masculinity, um, that he was raised on. Um, I think those are in conflict to his adoration for her and you see him wanting to do and say the right things, but ultimately, uh, he can't shake this feeling of insecurity and that's something I really wanted to tap into this movie is is the unsettling link between female empowerment and male insecurity um, and how you know a woman being strong you know can make can trigger you know um, men in, in a deeply vulnerable way and um, trigger low self-worth. 
I want to ask you about the construction of the story. And when you're writing those characters, how do you channel at least a little bit of anger into what you're writing about? Because it feels mm -hmm. like there is some anger and also not run the risk of making these characters. Um, we may not have to like them, but we might have to understand how we understand them. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I wrote, I wrote this story from a place of pain and originally anger and also shame, shame for minimizing myself in relationships um, because I wanted to protect the ego of the man that I loved. And it was also something that I just accepted. It'd be something that became very normalized to me and just the way I thought it was. It was just like, this is just what women kind of have to deal with. And cause there's something about like a wounded male ego that's always been, um, off limits. Um, and I think that women have come to fear it as much as men. Um, because women walk on eggshells, you know, trying to protect it because they know that a wounded male ego has devastating consequences on their relationships. So you see Emily really lifting him up as much as she can because she knows that him, when he's in, him in a good place is good for the relationship. And that's kind of like, the, that, that's a double standard that I want to call attention to. It's like, why is it, you know, that a man's success is always a win for the relationship, but when it's the other way around, why is it a threat? Um, and that's really the heart of the movie. I want to ask you about power dynamics because you work in the business. You've yeah. been writing and working on t in television, not a business that's known for being open to women mm -hmm. um, and also a business that is known for both micro and macro aggressions against women. Mm -hmm. Were there things that you observed in the workplace that you put into the story separate from your own personal experiences in your relationships? Uh, absolutely. I think that the reason why I wrote the story is because of how personal this was and, you know, what, to, what women kind of have to do to, to fight their way to the top, you know, or to fight their way just through their daily job. I think that women have to inflate themselves uh, to uh, survive in that kind of masculine environment and have to play more of like an alpha, lean into the alpha side to earn the respect of those kinds of men. Uh, they have to push down their femininity. Um, and so what I was interested in telling the story is that you, a woman who has to inflate herself in that way during the day to survive at work and then deflate herself at night to survive at home. If you were to, as I have, if you have overheard conversations like parking lot conversations or arguments about this film, yeah. is that rewarding to you that people are fighting over it? Absolutely. I think that's why I don't, I don't make safe movies and I want to, I want to stir the pot. And I think that these people are going to come out of this movie. Um, some people are going to come out feeling really heated. And I think that it's important to have these conversations. It's important to, to have this debate. Um, because the truth is, is that we've gotten too quiet on these issues. So let's, let's bring it out. Let's, let's bring it out. Let, let, let's see what people have to say and let's talk about it. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That was Chloe DeMont, who wrote and directed Fair Play, which premiered at this year's Sundance Film Festival. The film's release date has not been set. Thanks for listening to Retake. I'm John Horn. We'll see you again next week. And in the meantime, if you're interested, sign up for our weekly email newsletter, which includes recommendations of movies, TV shows, and other things that I think are worth your time. You could sign up at Elias.com slash newsletters. Retake is produced and engineered by Michael Cosentino and Monica Bushman. The editor is Suzanne Levy. And a special thanks to the entire KPCC Elias newsroom. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. KPCC supporters include UCLA's Department of Statistics. Their Master's of Applied Statistics program teaches advanced data science to working professionals. The program trains students in the latest methods in data science and quantitative analytics. The program also prepares students for careers as data scientists, data analysts, and statisticians. All courses meet in the evenings. Learn more at master.stat.ucla.edu.